ladies and gentlemen, here we go. I would like to thank everyone for joining us for the first episode tonight here on Sober Sit Down. I am your host, Scotty Stutch, and with me today is my first guest, a longtime inspiration to me in recovery, and now today I'm blessed to call him a friend of mine, Mr. Larry Mazza. So to clear the air, just so everybody's on the same page, you don't have to be active in recovery or a struggling addict to enjoy what our content is about. It's about everybody from business owners to addicts to people that had to restart life. It's never too late to start over. And that's the message we're trying to express here at the Sober Sit Down. Um, unfortunately, my story does have to deal with addiction. So the motive is I'm Scott, I'm sober, and I'm having a sit down. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Larry Mazza. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a privilege to be your first uh, guest. I'm honored by that. And you're doing a great thing. There's lots of people that have gone through uh, different predicaments in their life. Uh, you know, mine wasn't drugs or alcohol, uh, but uh, I guess I was addicted to making money and thought the easy way was to become a gangster. Uh, and I know that that's the wrong way now. That's great. You know what they say the uh, definition of insanity is, is doing the same detrimental thing over and over and over. So if you don't catch on to your mistakes and rebound and try to come back for your loved ones, if not yourself, uh, then you're insane. So I know I'm not insane. So Larry, so, why don't we why I'm moving take forward. Guess back to your teenage years in the 1970s? Let's just say you growing up in Brooklyn, I'm sure it was just like it portrayed in Saturday Night Fever. Correct or incorrect? Well, I, no, that, you know what? Uh, that's a first. We've never really, on all the podcasts I've done, that is a great description of my era. Because I was going to nightclubs 14, 15 years old. 15. And I remember, like, my parents dropped us off a block away because we didn't want the girls to think we were that young. So we would get the fake IDs. And go into these nightclubs, 15 years old. And, uh, you know, they were discos back then. And it was dancing and it was it was a, a place to meet. And, yeah, just like Saturday Night uh, Fever, uh, we all had the haircuts like Travolta. And, you know, we all you know, danced and, and, and just uh, absolutely were living in that era. It, you know, I was Joe Disco as all my friends were. You know, we couldn't wait for Friday night. And I did that probably for like, two or three years uh and it was just three four nights a week at, at, at discos i went down for spring break to fort lauderdale and i'll never forget those times in those discos and yeah it was just a, a phenomenal time uh none of us were gangsters we were all uh athletes martial artists uh you know i was in school I had jobs. Uh, I was growing up like a typical good family would bring up a kid. You know, my father was a fireman, a lieutenant, proud of him. It's always been tough because he was such a good role model. And I, uh, I made the mistakes. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so I had a good mother, obviously. She's still with me. And, you know, good family, had no reason whatsoever to deviate from the path of going to John Jay College to become, uh, you know, a fire chief or, uh, you know, even dabbled with law enforcement of some kind, but not just top. I was looking for something higher. Uh, and like I said, if I would have been on the fire department, I would have studied and took the tests and worked my way <clears throat> right up to chief. Uh, that would have been my goal from day one. And unfortunately, anything I did in life, including getting into the, to the mob world, I excelled at that. I knew what, I learned what it took. I learned from the best and we'll get to him uh, eventually. And where I was, you were groomed and educated from a young age to be uh, a consummate wise guy. You were going to be just like my the teacher and if you got in pretty deep which i did you could never show weakness 
and I wound up excelling in the life. I was a big earner. Uh, I learned to do the things you had to do, which we know are hurting people and even shooting people. And uh, it became second nature, which is sad to say, but it could happen to anyone. And one of the cops on my case said, if a sweetheart like Larry could wind up in that, anybody could. So, you know, it's, uh, and typically you're recruited at a young age when you're a little naive and a little more enamored by the glamorous stuff, uh, like I was, and like a lot of young guys were, uh, that I grew up with, you know, in that life after I, you know, after my disco days. Uh, so again, you know, uh, whatever I chose to do, and I made the mistake of choosing to leave school and pursue this other career. And there's reasons for that, which we'll get into. You know, um, you know, based off your story, um, which I suggest um, our viewers today go out and uh, check the link after the show. Um, Larry has, uh, Larry's the author of the book called The Life. It's a story about his life. Um, great description of, um, you know, beginning, middle and, you know, towards the end of that kind of that career that he was leading um, as, uh, you know, a high profile uh, organized crime figure, um, you know, you see, you say in a lot of your other interviews, Larry, you know, you grew up and you just kind of mentioned leave it to beaver style family. Um, mm -hmm. you know, your father was a firefighter, you know, your mom was a great um, yeah. mm -hmm. mom to her children. Um, you grew up in the setting and, you know, they all, mm -hmm. they always start off some of these, like these crime shows with, um, you know, the people that, you know, commit the heinous crimes of, uh, killing people, you know, are sociopathic maniacs. And what the message that I'm trying to send right now is that people need to understand that anybody that's groomed from a young age that can take the steps into that life and be shown a way of life that they've never seen before, I believe you're not born with those tendencies. Anybody can make anybody capable. It, it becomes the new normal. Okay? You just... You know, you, you, you brought along in baby steps things that they know you can handle and they see how you handle that. Then you're asked to do something a little bit more serious, then a little bit more serious. And now this is over years. It's not over weeks. And, you know, you, you're allowed to do certain things to earn. Then they see you're capable and you can expand and you can run a business. Then you get more and more rope to hang yourself. So that, that's what happens. It's uh, it just becomes the new normal. And I've seen, you know, kids younger than me and, 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 and like Greg's youngest kids just think this is normal. And it's not. It's not. But you're brought up thinking it is and you're taught that. So uh, it, it, it's easy. And, you know, it, it wasn't only my family who I grew up with. Uh, the whole group of us was like Leave it to Beaver. We had, uh, uh, you know, a, probably two or three of my friends' fathers were either firemen, sanitation, cops, civil servants. Uh, one or two owned their own business. Uh, so there's, you know, it, I wasn't, you know, uh, just, it, I was one of many, all the guys I grew up with. And we just, uh, like I said, none of us knew anything about the gangster life, uh, really, until I met uh, uh, Linda, Greg's, you know, common law wife or one of his wives. And uh, as people, a lot of people know, but I'll explain it here. Uh, I was delivering groceries, uh, among other jobs at a supermarket. And I, we, Linda and I started getting friendly and I was much younger. I was not quite 18 yet. And she was probably around 31. And eventually we wound up having an affair. And it was a lot of feeling because it lasted almost 10 years and we, I, it just made it easier for me to think this was the right move that I had, you know, all this help from the influential husband. Uh, and I'm doing the Reader's Digest version here. I mean, there's a lot to be told and, you know, down the road, like I said, we'll, we'll certainly do a part two to this and we could get into more detail of if, if, you know, you, see the feedback you get, whether it's the affair or the war, but, uh, but to get back on track, that was the door that opened. And now once I stepped into that door, some of my friends followed. 
you know, and that was the first real uh, inkling we got of uh, uh, the mob world. Um, that really stuck out to me. Two things was um, number one, yeah. um, you know, this is why I believe that you were really an inspiration to me because you and me kind of have a similar story coming up. Um, you know, I grew up in my, in my father's family business in the restaurant industry. Um, you know, it was bartending, fast cash, easy money. You know, my friends all went to college. Um, I have a criminal justice degree with mm -hmm. aspirations. Yeah. I wanted to get into some sort of law enforcement, stuff like that. Um, I actually at one point became a local CEO and I knew more inmates than I did guards. And I said, I don't belong in here. If I do, it's the other side of the fence. So, um, and, you know, like I said, I got, I had a criminal justice degree, you know, tried doing that life and uh, it just wasn't for me. And I mean, there's days, I'll, I'll tell you, mm -hmm. I'm a CDL truck driver, as you know, by trade right now. And it sucks waiting for a paycheck. It really does. But being able to go to bed at night, yes. knowing that I worked for my money, that I did it the right way. I don't have to sit there and stress at night wondering like, right. if I need to get in trouble for the way I made my money. Right. Well, and also it's, it's steady, you know, uh, the rackets, unless you build a good business, you know, uh, probably 75% of guys in the rackets are hangers on. They're just trying to do our jobs, trying to do scores here and there. It's the guys that make it more to the top that take their money and put it on the street or build sports businesses. That's what I, I built up a little mini sports empire and I made a fortune, but it was a business. It wasn't dirty. It wasn't, uh, and it was regular you know i wasn't going day to day i knew the next day there's gonna be football uh, the next week there's basketball there's baseball there's sports there's horses and people want to bet so you get a good reputation with paying and uh you're you're discreet about it and you build a phenomenal business a lot of guys aren't capable of that and you know greg was well that's what i was going to get at graves then they say Gravesend in the 70s and the 80s was the breeding grounds for the Italian mob, Italian American mafia. Um, oh, yeah. There, there's other places too, but yes. Uh, Gravesend, very much so. Uh, you know, Dyka Heights was big. Downtown Brooklyn, you had like the Gallows and, and guys like that with downtown. Uh, you know, Persico and, and Greg, my boss, were Dyka Heights. Uh, but you know, around my area, you had Mimi, Shello, you had, uh, Nikki Black from Avenue, U, uh, you know, Sally and Funzy D were big names back then. And, and then a whole bunch more, more in my time, you know, you had, uh, Joe W from the area. Uh, it's really endless, but it, yeah, but I'd say that probably the capital you had, uh, Rosales with Tommy Lombardi and. And the Genovese yeah. crew, so yeah. I think they're actually coming out with a show called Graves End pretty soon. William DeMeo, I think, is going to be starring in it. Yeah. I think they, I, they're actually doing a second season. Uh, and you know, I take my hat off to the kid. I, he, he doesn't like me for some reason, so I guess I got to reciprocate by not being too fond of him. I never met him. Uh, I know he's not Italian. Uh, he didn't live the life. Uh, uh, it's a fake name, but but you got to give him credit because he got a second season and it's hard to get the first season. Uh, and, you know, there was some good things about the movie, the TV show uh, that we're talking about. I think there was a ton of overacting like guys. Oh, he should have been able to cast that with guys that really live the life. There's so many of us out there, you know, it's like he went for these old guys that are a little bit known, but they're just overacting. That's the one critique I would make. But the music, the neighborhood, and all of that is a lot of fun to watch. And again, I'm not uh, critiquing him in a bad way because I'd love to get a second season. I'd love to get a first season uh, on my show to life. Uh, my talk show, I, I got a second season. We did the first season, and we'll, we'll talk about that later on. But, uh, but yeah, Gravesend, that is the area, and it's a great name. I almost named my book that. I almost named my book Gravesend. Well, what it is, really, it had something to do with the, uh, the Revolutionary War. It's a very historic area. You had Fort Hamilton. It's still there, which was the gateway to the Hudson River where the Verrazano Bridge is. 
So that was a big, big winning area where both sides needed to win to have access up and down the coast. And, you know, this was fighting for, uh, for the country to become a free country. So that was, so that whole area, there were trails uh, from the beach because we're very close to the beach, Coney Island. And there was an area where there's graves. And at the end of the graves was uh, an actual cemetery. They built a lot of graves along the way. But at the end of it, there's Van Sicklin, Lake Street Avenue. It's right where Nikki Black got hit. There's right that spot, Gravesend. Uh, Lady Moody Square, there's a house there that George Washington slept in. It's a fact. They won't let him take the house down. It's, it's a historical landmark. So there's a lot of history in that area. And then it goes right across the river into Jersey. Well, that's what we were told. He said they didn't want us to have our own uh, structure, our own government within the government. And that's what we want. We live by our own rules, our own uh, justice system, and they didn't want that. They didn't want the structure. They wanted to break us down, just be, you know, gangs or a group of bookmakers, a group of not not part of an entity where money's trickling up and there's a foundation. Uh, and they pretty much got what they wanted. But here's the funny thing. If you go back far enough, you're just a J. Edgar Hoover, who was one of the most famous FBI directors ever. He would never admit there was a... Because it was a crossroads, right? a mafia. He wouldn't admit it. He said, no, it's not true. So why is that? Well, that's what I said. It's either because somebody had the goods on him that really knew he put on the high heels and a wig at night and the fishnet stockings. You know, if they knew that about him for a fact and could expose that, that's not a good uh, uh, scenario for the FBI. Uh, that, and also, he was a degenerate horse player. So... It was said that the mob guys would give him tips on horses. And when they won, he sort of was happy they were there. You know, and who knows if he had to borrow money if he was that bit of a gambler. Uh, so, it, you know, they, they kept their eyes closed to it. They allowed it to get stronger and stronger. Then all of a sudden, Rudolph Giuliani comes along, and he decides to be this crusader. And, you know, of course, it was right smack in the middle of my time finally making it somewhere. You know, and uh, he tore, you know, tore apart the family. He did the real yeah, thing for the first time. Um, I think time. that was the end of the era right around that time when they came in with all that stuff. I mean, like you, um, somebody was saying in a recent interview, you know, gangsters now and gangsters then. Like, I mean, no disrespect to anybody still in the game. I mean, there's no way anybody can pull off some of the stuff, some of the legends yeah. did back in the day with the way there's camera phones. I mean, if you're a bookmaker and somebody owes you money, you go in a bar and try, you know, shake right. someone down. People got their camera phones off. It's going on YouTube. You can't do that type of life now. And, I, and, I, and I'm not condoning violence. I'm not condoning any of it. I'm not glorifying yeah. it by any means. I'm just saying that, like, it's, it's actually documented in books, like, where I come from. I'm, I'm from Pittston, Pennsylvania. Um, Robert De Niro, as you know, as you were a consultant to on The Irishman, he mentions it right in being The Irishman. He's going to pick up Russ, who's Russ Buffalino, played by Joe Pesci. Um it's documented that the government actually reached out to Russell right. Buffalino and, and other members of higher uh, members of like the, um, the uh, five families to try and take out Fidel Castro because the government and the CIA couldn't get yeah. their hands on him. And it was all over when Lucky Luciano started yeah. the casinos down in Havana and the casinos got taken off them. So they wanted, you know, they said the mob wanted their casinos back. The CIA wanted Fidel Castro, right. so now they're reaching out to the mob for help, but they're but they don't like the mob. So it's like the government, you know, they're so hypocritical. It makes me sick. They only want you when you're doing them a favor. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. They're very self-serving. They want to step up the ladder for power that way. Uh, yeah, but he wasn't the first one. Luciano worked with them on the ports in New Jersey. Um, one of the wars uh, against the, I, it had to be World War II because there was this group of uh, some kind of Nazis that were coming in to try to, you know, work for the Germans and they cut it off at the ports. Uh, and they're not supposed to do anything with the government, but he's turned around and says, well, I'm doing a patriotic act. So, you know, a lot of guys would have been killed for that. Right. Greg Sloper Sr. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he, uh, he went and it was, uh, it, it was, it was, portrayed in the movie uh, Mississippi Burning, they hired a gangster 
to go down to Mississippi and find the bodies of these civil liberties workers. They wanted to, uh, and it was a good thing. I mean, obviously, uh, to to give equality to all races, the blacks especially at that time. And but the uh, Ku Klux Klan wasn't bending; they weren't giving in. And and Greg uh, did some things to them that they opened up and told where the bodies were. And it sort of was uh, <laughs> that gave my boss carte blanche for the next thirty years. Reference. This was in the sixties, and for the rest of the time, uh, he could do whatever he wanted. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So he, uh, no, but he was, uh, yeah, a lot of people ask uh, me, they're like, you know, like, was about, like, you, know, you know, you're, you're running a sobriety podcast, which is only half true here. And, you know, and they say like, you know, bringing on, you know, people that live the life in a mob. And I don't think people mm-hmm. understand some of the similarities that the life of a mobster and the life of an addict share with one another. I mean, for number one, I mean, you know, you have two options when you get into the life of being a mobster, or if you get into the life of being an addict you're gonna die or go to jail and if you survive you're here like us trying to prevent people from going into mm-hmm. that life uh, number two is you know i feel as i feel as though that once you're in it's right. very hard to get well, out yep. and that's on both sides of the life yeah. in my song there's a line once in the life there ain't no getting out I don't know if you listened to the song yet, but it's a really dynamite song, Sinatra type of music. Uh, but it's also about choices, okay? Uh, and and ch- making the choice towards self-destruction. And I had a guy on my show, Stevie Lanahan, that described his, first of all, he hates himself for ever working with the government. Uh, he, he'll never be the same person inside. You know, some people just can never get it out of their heads what they did and he's one of them but he said if he had to do it again he because of the circumstances he'd do the same thing and he uh said for kids for other kids growing up he says you have to know this now you will be sitting where i am now or in jail for life those are your two so you got the choice just like an addict you have a choice Sometimes your, you know, the addictions you're talking about are more physical. So I don't want to get into that, the medical end of it. But you have a choice to continue drinking, smoking pot, whatever you're doing that's to an excess. And I had the choice. I was addicted to the life, too. I got addicted to the life. The, the Like I said, the glamorous parts of it. Uh, I'm going to steal another guy. Because with the show I had, I've got so many. And I want to tell the people about that so they know what I'm talking about. Uh I've gotten so many other opinions. And one of them was that I would go to a nightclub or the fanciest restaurant in Manhattan. And you'd see people online like doctors, famous news people. And they see me and they open the thing. They let me right in. There's a brain surgeon waiting online. And they let me a mob stand shows you the the glamour of it, you know. So that's addicting, and the money is addicting, especially if you have a good business. Now I'm not talking about that. Uh, what do they call it? The instant gratification money, like picking up a grand, a big pile of cocaine and handing it off for three thousand more. That's instant gratification. That doesn't take too much brains, as far as I'm concerned. I I, I don't really know how it. Would to sell drugs, but I built a business with sports, gambling, and horses with hundreds and hundreds of clients and agents or runners, they're called both nowadays, uh, that have players of their own. And it just multiplies and multiplies. And the more you, you know, it's a big responsibility, there's bigger payouts, there's bigger collections. Uh, it becomes more of a 24 7 job. It's a job. You got to be on top of it, you know. So, uh, but I've gotten lots of feedback from people. And let, let me jump in and, and tell the, the audience about the show. It's called The Life, it's a talk show. It can be found right now on Plex TV, which is an app. And once it's a free app, once you get on Plex, you just go to Mob, uh, Mob TV, hit that, and you'll see all the shows. Right now, I'm the first live show for Mob TV. So, 
every week a new episode comes out. The second season is going to be coming out very, very soon. Uh, eventually, the station will have much more distribution and uh, more outlets for people to see it. You can see it on any smart device right now. Uh, and also, we're working on uh, a platform like yours, which is going to be in a studio, so it'll be the same. Uh, not You look very professional, so don't take this the wrong way. It'll be professional with a background from high-end producers. This guy is a, 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 Joe Paletto. Uh, his partner is Terry Winters. Terry Winters. He wrote Goodfellas. The writer. Right. So we have, those are the guys at the top. Okay. And they're going to, uh, no, that was Nick Pelletch. Okay. He wrote American Gangster, Wolf of Wall Street. He's a Scorsese guy. Uh, the Boardwalk Empire. Uh, and another one that you would know, too. Oh, Sopranos. He was the main writer in The Sopranos. So he's, those are the top two names on, on Mob TV. I'm the fifth name. I'm the technical advisor to, to Mob TV. But I have the show, and it's, like I guess I'm getting a lot of good insight from different people, whether they're ex-law enforcement, ex-mob guys, uh, family members, people that were hurt by the mob, different views. So I'm learning from that. And I just want to say this, it will be eventually also on a platform like you have where It'll be on Mob TV for two or three months, and then it'll shift over where people can just hit YouTube or wherever it is and see the show on demand. Right now, it's live, so you can't see it on demand. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a stepping stone. I'm glad you touched on that because I have on my list of things to do for you to bring that up to yeah, explain exactly. to people how exactly. they can inquire about the Plex TV. Yeah, good. Yeah, well, it's very simple. It's a free app, and anybody that knows, if I was able to get on tonight, anybody could do it. I was having trouble with the app to get us together. But, you know, Frankie Steele, Pontillo, uh, who's not, is not, not quite a neighbor, but he's not far from you, he has a show, too, coming out called Mobsters vs. Monsters. I just saw the sizzle piece uh, today, and he should be getting it, too. My wife got it from the producer. She sent it to me, and she sent it to Frankie. And it's been out at different places. It will be on Mob TV also, but this show is very possibly going to make it to Netflix or uh, Showtime. It's about four ex mobsters that did time together and they decided while they were away, it's true, they wanted to come out and do something more uh, like we are, just trying to do something better with your life. And they all believe, well, three of them believe in paranormal. So these four guys want a bigger character than the next. I mean, they're funny, they're serious, they're tough. And so it's a great, great uh, reality show. They go out looking for Bigfoot and they go out tracking down the New Jersey devil, uh, you know, ghosts and different things like that, uh, UFO sightings. And they got into some little scary situations out in the woods where they heard these spirits talk to them. We got it on film. I mean, it's there. So uh, they're very close, I believe, to having a show either on one of those platforms. Uh, it's so hard. It's so hard and it moves at a snail's pace. Uh, and here's how I describe it. When you're working on, like even my show, Life, uh, I'll get to my point. I was brought in, like you mentioned, because of my book and because of the detectives on the case that were uh, uh, task force guys, when De Niro was doing The Irishman, he was looking for somebody that had been in life and that could help him with different idiosyncrasies so and different ways and talking patterns and whatever. So they all said, Larry's the guy you want. And they gave him my book. He loved the book, told me it was terrific three or four times. He said he's this close to endorsing it, meaning it would be something he's going to work on. Uh, and it's only because he's so busy, he couldn't do it right then and there. But he made me meet, the, he brought me to Scorsese's house. He brought me to Nick Pelleggi's house, Goodfellas Casino. Uh, and I sat with these guys and we talked. You would think it was a done deal. But what happens, De Niro starts going through a divorce. The pandemic hits, closes everything down. So, Two years goes by and, you know, they have other projects in the mix. So it's sort of, I don't want to say it fizzled, it's on the table. 
So now Joe Paletto comes along and he's starting this mob TV and he's, he's getting back in the game. He's a guy that started uh, Comedy Central years ago. So he wants to get back in and very successful guy. So we have him now doing it, but the stars have to align. You got to get the right people. You got to get that De Niro, Joe Paletto, Netflix, everybody on board for a project like mine, because it's, it's a time period. It goes from the 70s, maybe the 60s, because of Greg, into the 70s and 80s, all the way up to the 90s. So those are all different cars, all different clothing. Like you said, in the 70s, I got to dress like John Travolta. In the 80s, I got to dress like John Gotti. In the 90s, I'm in prison garb. You know, we talked briefly, and you had mentioned something. And I think it's a good time to bring it up. The day I got brought into prison, I knew, forget making a deal, whatever my outcome was, I was going to be in for a long time. I never thought life because I didn't want that to happen. I says, I'll, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to fight it. I'm going to get investigators. I'm going to get this and I'm going to get that. And we spent a fortune. And I was hoping to get a plea of... 15 years. I thought it was reasonable because I saw some guys higher than me getting 20 or 18 with bodies. So I figured there's a way I can, you know, and I, I could get my buddy Jimmy to come in, my partner, to take the same deal. That I got a package deal, two guys for one. So that was my goal. But I knew it was going to be a lot of years. 15, 20. Now, ultimately, you know, it came out that my boss was a rat. And it came out that uh, a long time informant. 30 year say. informant, right? Okay. And I 30 year informant. And Ali Boy and Junior Persico, his father, knew about him for 20 years. Ali Boy told me this. So once that happened, my mindset changed and I said, no, now I'm going to make a deal. But stepping back, I knew I was facing big time. So literally from day one, the first day in, I got on a physical fitness routine, push-ups, sit-ups, whatever I had at my disposal. If there were steps, the first place I was in was a, a one that you may be familiar with, county jail, where it's a pod, you know, and there's two tiers. So there's one step up and down. So I would run up and down the steps a hundred times a day. I would do push-ups in the afternoon till I did 400 push-ups, then 500, then 600. I would do abs. Eventually I got to MCC. There's a little bit more. There you have a heavy bag. You have, uh, you know, a bow, a bow flex with some rubber equipment. So you have a little bit more to work with. Then when you get to Otisville, which is a, a place where you do your that's time, in New York, right? a transient place, you actually have weight equipment. And that's a federal and an outdoor right? Yes, upstate New York and sports. I don't want to. My point is, I was going to better myself for whatever years I was going to lose now. I will put on at the end. I will add those back. I will be healthier. I'll live a longer life. And I also meant, did it mentally. I took a lot of courses. I took writing courses. I took a screenwriting course. I took uh, health and fitness courses which I was always an instructor or a trainer or uh, uh, a teacher. So that was easy. I coached basketball right through the war that we wound up in. And uh, I knew I would come out with a better game plan for success. It's too easy to settle. It's too easy to settle uh, and just, well, I shouldn't say that. Some people prefer to just settle for their job and their paycheck. And a lot of people go through life that way. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, now, like I said, if I would have been a fireman, when I got on the job and just stayed a fireman, to me, that would have been shortchanging myself. It's a starting place, but I, I would have always said, okay, I'll take the test for lieutenant. Then I'll take the test for captain. Then I'll take the test for chief. You know, over six, seven years, I could have been a 28-year-old chief, 29-year-old chief, 
and had another 10 years left till my pension or maybe stayed longer. Uh, but that's what I would do. If I got into um, law enforcement, I would want to be uh, a top guy. I wouldn't want to be a, just a patrol guy. I would want to be maybe that, I hate to say this, that that uh, super narcotic guy that goes out and infiltrates these heavyweight uh, uh Who's those guys, like those big Mexican cartel guys? I would always look for that top thing, you know? And that's what I says, even as a gangster, I didn't settle. I wasn't just going to be a hanger-on guy. I built my own business, had a crew of my own, got elevated. A lot of people don't understand what that means. It's it's not this big uh, uh, secret ceremony anymore where, you know, we go into a cave in Italy, and, and it's just not that way. You get recognize they bring you along they have a meeting uh i also had a meeting with the consul yet at the end of the war where i was going direct to him if you know the life it means you're the next captain i'm going direct to, to the consul yet and all the guys that were around us they couldn't go they had to come to me and i would go to him you know i don't, I don't know why people would think i would make that up or you know or they wanted to, i said this hate is out there but it is what it is. I, we did so much during the war, which we need to talk about at some point, uh, my partner and I, that we were brought in. We were told by the boss of the family, get the guys recognized, meaning make, make them brothers, make them family. And we had it. We had a, a little lackluster ceremony. I won't even call it a ceremony. It was a meeting. And it was, uh, you know, our boss, our consulier, a couple of captains, uh, uh Greg, who was made a captain, uh, and, you know, after it happened, we went to see Greg Jr., who was still our skipper, our official skipper, and to be introduced, because Greg, you know, Greg Sr. Uh, eventually had the AIDS and was going to probably die soon, uh, so we needed to have a witness that of the structure we had. We were good fellows, and we were under Greg Jr., so all these things happened in the, in, in the you know, in the trenches, and because I didn't make the newspapers like John Gotti every next day or uh, the whole world didn't know me because I preferred to be a low profile. And, you know, people listen to me and I don't curse a lot. I, I could speak uh, very well because I went to college, I, you know, uh, so they want to downplay me or say he's a liar or he's not a real, but all you got to do is read court papers and, newspapers and yeah uh, you know and you know Larry, uh, that's uh, where i to go back to the this, pudding to me uh, prior to this you know what you mentioned um i would have nothing but the utmost respect for you had you chose that mm -hmm. other career in the fire department and you know it, it worked itself out and you took the legacy of what your father did i have nothing but the utmost respect for your father mm -hmm. and i would have nothing but the utmost respect for you but let's face the facts here about mm -hmm. growth and opportunity we wouldn't be sitting here today trying to reach out to this audience to try and help people move forward in life. I really don't think that you, if you chose that career path, I don't believe that you would be sitting next to Robert De Niro on the set of the Irishman. I mean, talk about accomplishments. No, no, no. listen, that's, you're a hundred percent right. And you know, there's something Greg told me and it makes all the sense in the world. You get dealt the hand of cards, from God. You could only play that hand that you have. Or if you're playing a game, you discard, you pivot the card. You gotta play them as they come. Okay. So once I met Linda and, and got into the life, now I had to play this hand a certain way, especially as I got closer to him and he's bringing me places. I'm meeting people. So yeah. And then we go through this war and I go do time. I played that hand. Yeah, so now, after the time away, I come back, and like I said, I could have had a, a good job with a family member traveling, doing on-site reviews for companies, uh, which was a government type of thing, and it, it paid well, and I, it would have been a career for me. And all this other stuff I'm doing would have been on the back burner. I wouldn't have been in a rush to write a book or, or to continue. I would have had a life that I could have pursued and, and, and did well. But because they didn't want me traveling, I couldn't take that job. 
So now I'm at a crossroads again in my life. I could take the wrong step and say, you know what? Let me just go back to crime. Let me go back to what I know. Or I could come up with a, a plan. And my plan was my story. I said, I'm going to finish this book. I started the book in prison and I'm going to finish it. And I'm going to write it myself. Well, I wasn't at first going to write it myself, but I had two or three authors tell me, you don't need me. You're wasting your money. Do it yourself. Everything you have here is perfect. So I just got an editor at the end. Then I self-published through a printer. And now when you're not a, a known author, nobody's going to just go buy my book. I had to do the legwork. I had to do book signings. I had to do podcasts. I had to do, I did the mom museum, which was a very good one. Uh, I had to do uh, uh, different grand openings for people, constantly getting my name and my book out there and my story, almost making a brand. So I played this corrupt ex-cop uh, suspected of murder and I had a really good part. I wasn't acting, I was able to be myself. And I was a little sarcastic with the cops when they came to see me and things like that. So that opened doors. Then I got to meet Pileggi. And like I said, later on, Scorsese, uh, uh, Joe Paletto, Terry Winter. So it's the same thing I said. Whatever I'm doing, I'm not settling for the bottom or the middle. And not too many people got to sit with cinematic royalty. And that's what that is. Scorsese, De Niro and uh, uh, Nick Pelleggi. That's royalty, especially in the mob genre. I met Armand de Sante, who was probably uh, the most genuine, uh, giving, and just gracious guy you'll ever meet in Hollywood. And he's got, he's got a great name, Armand de Sante. He's the best John Gotti that they ever played. Uh, and he's a dear friend. I mean, I could call him. He always gets right back to me. I met Michael Madsen. He was mm -hmm. uh, Sonny Black in uh, the movie with Johnny Depp, Donnie Brasco. And another really nice guy. Unfortunately, he has demons. Uh, he probably needs to, to get on our show and talk about trying to recover because he's got, he's got ups and downs with drinking. Great and, actor. Uh, I don't know if it's drugs, too. But, he, you know, he, he – and what a talent. What, what a talent. It's a shame. Yeah, really. Uh, but he's got those demons. And again, it's all walks of life. I, you know, one of the greatest fighters I've been around, uh, Donnie Hare, great uh, kickboxing uh, local champion, more than local champion. He's, he's traveled around. And uh, he just couldn't beat the booze. And I think he started doing heavier stuff. And he just passed away, you know, well, five years ago or so. But he was a partner of mine in some dojos in Florida. We had a great rapport, uh, you know, we brought in Donnie the Dragon Wilson, who's a freaking 10, 11-time champion, and he would open up on new gyms. Uh, so all those things, I've, you know, even that, you know, how many guys in the kickboxing industry or, or gym could say that? They had Don Wilson, uh, an actor, 11-time uh, champ, come and, and help us open our gyms. You know, uh, so, I, you know, I'm blessed. I got to say that. I've been blessed since... I've gotten out and I embarked on my whole new career. I, I've been blessed. To go back to what uh, you were saying. But I, I like to think that you earned that blessing. Like, you like know, you earned respect. Some of the so. good mob movies are really good, but they get a little too Hollywood. I think it doesn't get no more real than when he did the HBO version of Gotti. Um, Armando Sandy, that's the closest you're going to get mm -hmm. to the real version of how the life is. Well, here's the thing. I'll give you a little tidbit. He handpicked his co-stars. And everybody in that movie played the part almost to a T. Okay? Uh, it was almost educational because it was so well done. You know, where, where, where uh, Anthony Quinn, who played Anello De La Croce, when he schools John, about the mistakes he's making. You can't do this. That's very real. I went through that. Greg did that with me. Not on the same level, because I was a nut or an egotistical nut like John. I fell in line. I understood the life, and, uh, you know, I was more, I go with the flow. 
You know, I was I never had dreams of being the boss or or being the biggest drug dealer. Now I had to kill the boss because of all the drugs I'm dealing. I stood away from all that. Uh, I lived the life like it's supposed to be lived. And uh, the other guy was Joe Piney, who played that's Uncle Junior from Sopranos played the part. He was the consul. Yeah, he told John what you did. Kill him, Paul. He says, there's a young kid out there now with a bullet waiting for you because you broke the biggest rule of Cosa Nostra. You whacked the boss. That's the biggest rule. And, yeah, not even Omerta. The biggest rule is to respect the boss of the family as the boss forever. And he didn't do that. So uh, I don't, I, I'm not a big John Guy fan, you know. Uh, yeah, he stood up. He did all that time and everything like that. But that doesn't, to me, you know, that's not that's not the whole picture. You know, there's more there's more to it. And uh, I've always said there's a lot more than one yeah. way to rat. And there's a lot of guys out there that found their own little niche. Whitey Bulger, you know, Greg, uh, you know, different people. I'm not going to get into it too deeply. But there's others, too, that, you know, they, they cop out in a way that they're destroying the people behind them. Uh, but it's okay. I'm, I'm going to do my eight years and go home. You know, but you just made it easier for them to give me life. You know, so there's lots of ways. But yeah, there's a lot of backstabbing. Uh, like my own boss, Junior, he took the stand. He's not supposed to take the stand. If any of us did that, we'd be dead. He, he was his own attorney. He played lawyer for himself so he could say that he was a good fella, but he wasn't the boss. We'd all be killed for that. He admitted he was a good fella. We were saying how, you know, everybody's supposed to abide by the rules. The rules aren't for just some. And the higher up you get, I guess they believe they got more liberties to play the little pawns. And, for example, on my case, you know, I was on a case with Ali Perzigo Jr. Uh, and Joe Russo. One was the future boss. One was the underboss of the Perzigo faction. They wrote a closing summation, and I got my hands on it because we were using the same paperwork every day. We were fighting the case together. One day they went down without me, and I'm reading through the paperwork. They must have left it there inadvertently because it was a closing summation that they wanted their lawyer to say, and it was to blame the whole war on Greg and his guys. Now, there's no doubt about who Greg's guys were. That's me and Jimmy. There were others also, but the guy sitting right there that would have, the jury would have been looking at. So they were re looking to sacrifice us. Greg was already finished. He was dying of AIDS, whatever. He was going to do his deathbed confession. But Jimmy and I were fighting tooth and nail. We were paying fortunes of money to investigators and lawyers and, uh, you know, doing everything you're supposed to do. But each day something else happened that goes against you. Yeah, and one of them was Greg, of course, my boss being uh, uh, an informer for 30 years, Alley Boy uh, telling us he knew about it, along with his father, and then to see that closing summation where they're just going to throw us under the bus. So who's the red? If they could do that to me, the guy that was on Front Street with Greg and, and his crew every day, getting shot at, shooting, if they can do that to us, Where's there any honor? We were on the front battle lines fighting for the Persico name. So I, you know, was not going to uh, give up my personal family or the, the rest of my life for that. I would have given it up for something, but not for what it turned out to be. You know, and what I say now is you can't rat on rats. And that whole life is one big rat. Yeah, I mean. Very um, few, very few, if any. That are that honorable. Yeah, I mean, from you know, these people that want to throw that word out, rat. It really, it really agitates yeah. me because like they were never in the life. These are these people that these underground trolls that sit on laptops and go on these blogs all day, or these you know these people that mm -hmm. you know are wannabes, or they're people that are in the media that probably lived a sheltered mm -hmm. life, never had to go out and hustle, um, mm -hmm. don't know anything about the streets. Um, and, you know, to me, you know, from layman's terms, I mean, here's my conception on this whole, you know, rat and thing. I mean, when you...
get into the life, you go through, and I don't need to tell you this, but this is me telling the audience, is you go into mm -hmm. what's called, when you're made, you agree to the omerta, which is the code of silence, and all the terms mm -hmm. and conditions of being in the mob. And it's pretty Along much- Along with other rules. O along with other rules, equally as important. Just want to let you back yeah. that in. And so when you're going into this with following rules and the code of silence and, you know, getting sworn into the emerge, stuff like that, take your sign a contract to, you know, be with this, this other alternate family, which is considered the family in the life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my thing is, is, um, you know, if these higher ups that are making you swear and swear the emerge and making you follow these rules, if they're not following the same rules themselves, you know, what gives them the right to be hypocritical as such? Well, and, go ahead. No, I was going to say, that, I, I, that's sort of my, that's my, uh, my point. You know, you can't just target one person or one rule or whatever. You know, Junior Persico took the stand. My boss was undercover for 30 years. You know, Captain Flip. The consulier during the war, Carmine Sessa, he set up the guys to get arrested the day he went into that meeting, St. Patrick's Cathedral. He was already wired up and ready to go with the feds. I mean, this is like, and that, that was early on. And since then, there was a brigade. They said that, uh, there was a line at the door. They turned guys down trying to make deals. Don't mention their names because two of them are in prison right now. They tried to make a deal. They were above me. They were official captains. They tried to make a deal. And if they were in the can, I'd mention it. If they were out on their own now. But they know who they are. So, you know, it, it's, you can't, you can't rat on a rat. I say this. Nobody likes rats or snitches. And I said this in my podcast and I mean it sincerely. I was in high school. And I took an extra apple at lunchtime from the cafeteria. I probably went like this, saw the, co the, the cops. I saw that the, the, the teachers weren't looking, and I grabbed an extra apple. The guy behind me snitched on me. I wound up getting detention. I spent a week after, I had to spend an hour after school every day because I stole that apple, an extra apple. That guy hurt me more than the guys in the family because I started getting used to it in the family. But, uh, an apple? Give me a break. You know, nobody likes snitches. Everybody wants, I grew up, keep your mouth shut, mind your business, don't call the cops. I still live by that. But if I get put in a big circle again with a bunch of guys doing the same things, that becomes insanity. I'm not insane. It can't happen again. I learned. And yeah, I mean, in my eyes, I mean, that's just totally like if the higher ups are not following the code and the rules, I mean, to be honest with you, that's pretty much like a breach of contract and no and void at that point. I mean, your life's yeah. on the line. It's a lot well, different. Than... Yeah, I told you, regardless what anybody thinks, when I was being told those rules official, okay, and again, it wasn't with a magic wand. There was no priest taking a sign of the cross. It wasn't, you know, no, no stardust coming out of the sky. But I was officially being told what I was and how the respect that I was going to get was equal to everybody else in that room, okay? And... When they talked about never taking over the family, the first thing that went through my mind was Vicarina. I said, didn't he, wasn't he, all that rule? And John Gotti, I said, they, they, they had to be told the same thing, yet they just went and tried to take over the family, kill the boss. Okay, when they talked about sleeping with other, other wives, there was, aside from me, okay, I knew of a few that were happening. One of them was a close associate of ours, a friend of, not a friend of us, but a crew member, was sleeping with the wife of someone who was in prison. That guy in prison asked for satisfaction. They said no, because the other guy was a son of somebody in Paul. He was the son of somebody, so he was allowed to break that rule to sleep with somebody's wife. See, I was right there around that. I saw it happening, okay? The drugs, when they told us, drugs are taboo. We will not touch, nobody earns in drugs and we keep them away. I'm thinking to myself, Reg Senior, he's sitting right there, okay? He was just made captain that day. Is the biggest drug dealer I know at the time. 
And I knew others who were in the game. You know, it, it's it's not, you know, uh, a secret. So they're sitting there these things, and none of them are true. And then, of course, Omerta. I don't even know if that word was used. They just says we do not deal with law enforcement. We don't talk to them. Oh, and the security knew that, you know, and went on to the last one, which was counterfeiting that nobody even talks about anymore. Counterfeiting, we're not supposed to get involved in counterfeit money. And it makes sense because we're making all the money in the street. We don't want people paying us with fake money. So we certainly don't want to get involved in that. But, you know, uh, I was, I remember that going through my head. And the other thing that went through my head was when they said, would I leave my mother in her deathbed? Okay. I felt this big when I said yes, but I knew I had to say yes. All those other guys said yes. And when we got in the car, I'll never think Greg saying, I'd never leave my mother at her deathbed. This is Greg, the Grim Reaper. He said that I wish I had her back because now he was doing well. He had all this money. He, he always told me that. I wish I could do more for my mother than I did, you know? So there's two sides to everybody, you know? But Greg was a smart one. He didn't, uh, he never had to take the stand or, or really make a deal with the governor. He made a deal way, way in, and, and had coverage. That's the man right there. Him, Whitey Bulger, and whoever else is doing it. But the young kids are never taught that. Of course, you know, we're, we're told that the, 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 the worst thing. The, the, don't even talk to them. They're worse than us. I don't think the police, police, the regular cops never do this. So. Well, while we're on that subject, Larry, um, you know, um, you know, when you're in that life and you just come in and, you know, nobody's, I don't think anybody's really made day one. You have to prove yourself and go through a waiting period and stuff like that. So when you get that call that, you know, um, you're going to get made, um, it's like getting called up to the pros, I believe, when you're in that life and you're like, you know, in comparison to like a pro athlete. Um, while we're on the subject, uh, would you like to share the story of the night you remember um, of how you were made? Well, yeah, it was actually an afternoon. Uh, what happened was there was a, a huge meeting that was going to take place. It was going to be the whole personal fact, faction. Probably 40 good fellas, uh, captains, officials, and a whole bunch of uh, crew members. And up to that point, Jimmy and I had been sitting down at every single meeting with Greg, with the boss Joe T with the underboss Jojo with the consulier Richie Fusco. Mine was on the lamb with Carmine up to that point. Other captains, we were sitting at the table. And number one, that's not tradition. Only good fellows could sit at that table with, when there's business going on. We were at the table for months. So, and the whooping during the war, nobody had a problem with that. So Teddy Persico, senior, brought a message to, uh, went to see uh, Junior Persico and told him what was going on. They're having this big meeting that you know, we're going to officially make Jojo Russo the uh, underboss. We're uh, going to officially swear Joe T in. He went and asked about me and Jimmy being part of that. Message came back, get those two guys recognized. After that meeting, Greg was officially up to captain for the first time in his career. Big Greg, senior. Greg Jr. was the official skipper. Uh, but Greg Sr. was never a captain. Probably has something to do with the deal he had with the government. But to get back to your question, after that meeting, it was mid-afternoon, late afternoon, we went down to uh, a restaurant. And the restaurant was not quite open yet. We had a table reserved in the back. And we were taking back Jimmy and I one at a time and then both of us together. And we were told, just like I said, it wasn't a long, uh, big ceremony where anything went on. But Joe T uh, did most of the talking. Carmine Sessa did some of the talking. And we were told every single rule. And from this moment on, you guys will be respected as good fellas. We were also told once the family gets back together, depending on how it happens and the who's officials, we may have to do it again. I didn't care. It didn't matter to me. You know? So uh, the, the very next day, the very next day, we get in the car, Greg Scarpa, 
Jimmy and myself, and we drive all the way to Leavenworth Prison for one reason. Greg Sr., he always was looking ahead. He wanted it on record with our skipper, Greg Jr., that we were straightened out and we were in the, officially in the family. So nobody could move us. I was under him, Greg, and I would go back to under Jr., Greg Jr., when he came home. So, I mean, it was a whole bunch of things that happened. And uh, not long after that, well, go back to so, so this little ceremony. It was nice. I felt a little, I felt good that I was being uh, shown some respect for what we went through in the war. It was sort of a, a reward. I got it. Uh, and later on, not too many months later, Greg is now on house arrest and he can't come out of the house. He's the captain. Richie Fusco calls me, who was our acting consul year, because Carmine Sess is on the lam right now. And he calls me to this meeting. I go to his club on 11th Avenue. I'll never forget. He tells me, he, he goes like this, let's go outside. He didn't want to talk in the club. So I know walking in the club, I saw two federal agent cars on each corner. I says, well, I don't where's, what's worse, walking in here or walking out there together? So he walks me down the avenue and he starts telling me that while Greg is where he's at, we may never see him again. You come direct to me from now on. Nobody else. And he mentioned guys from the club, from 13th Avenue. He says, you come to me with any of there be any problems. You're the only guy that can come to me. He was already sort of stepping me up to a, an acting captain spot. And I remember asking him, well, what about Jimmy? partner. Jimmy could come to me too. So Jimmy was also looked at a little bit higher as my lieutenant, if nothing more. But this all happened. So we were on a different level. Unfortunately, six months later, we were all arrested. So it really didn't matter. And I had people. I, I was introduced to Anthony Spiro, who was the, uh, might have been at the time, the acting boss of the, uh, the Bonanno family. Or definitely the consul, yeah. But he was top guy. And you know what he told Greg when Greg said, say hello to a friend of ours? He said, Larry has always been a friend of ours. That I felt so good when he said that. Because I'm a young kid. I'm still only 29. And I was proposed. That's another thing. I was proposed at about 27, about two years earlier. That's another thing. And that's documented everywhere. They had a chart, a family chart, from 84 when I was only 23. OK, that had me right next to Carmine Sesson, Jimmy right next to me as associates of interest. So that's because we were so tight with Greg, Carmine, myself, Jim. So, what you know, anybody that really doubts all of this, I don't get it. I don't know what they expect or what they want to hear. But you're the Grim Reaper's right hand man. You're involved in countless murders on one from one extent to the other as a shooter is not a shooter but i can't even remember all of them uh and being under him being groomed and what do you think his plans were for me i mean what would anybody think that i was gonna you know become a, a car service driver we're gonna open a car service together or, or uh, open a candy store together he had me in his sites to become a good fellow when I was 20. He knew what he was doing. So unfortunately it happened the way it did. Uh, the whole family fell apart. Uh, and you know, and here I am. I mean, I'm talking about it. So, so was that before uh, or after the Colombo Wars? That, that time era that you're talking about? Was that before or after the Colombo Wars? No, it was right during the war. It was in January, right maybe before. February. Because we, we had gotten Nikki Black the first week in January. There was a truce after that, a few weeks. We started putting our family together. We were going to put our family officially together and approach all the other families. That's why Joe T had to be sworn in. Joe Joe Russo had to be sworn in. Certain guys were up to captain, like Greg, and a few guys were brought in as good fellas. We were going to go, and that was our family. That was our Mogada. So, you know, uh, that was in February. And... Again, you know, we went through that summer and then early in the uh, in the fall or uh, took probably about six, seven months before we all started getting arrested. 
but it was during the war. It was it happened, and you know what? Junior Purcell got himself got straightened out during a war once, and that's probably why he pushed for it. He didn't think it was a problem with it, you know. But Joe T did say we may have to do this again, so. But we never did it again. There's no again coming, so. Yeah. So while we're on the topic of the Combo Wars, um, some um, old mm-hmm. things that you know still kind of pop to you. Um, do you want to share with the audience some um, some topics of discussion about the Combo Wars? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it was probably as bloody a war uh, as the, the mob's ever seen. It was, uh, you know, it was a, it was a nightmare. To live through it. I had to wear a bulletproof vest every day, carry at least one or two guns. We had a car that had the back seat Velcroed together, where you just had to rip off the back piece. And there was a rifle, a shotgun, a few pistols in the in the uh, cotton, uh, not the cotton, the foam behind. You know, don't forget these cars were older. And we had slots to drop guns out onto the floor driving around looking for people every single day to shoot. I mean, it's not easy. It was, it was, and, and getting shot at and, and noticing people whipping turns to chase you down. It was just a year of insanity. Uh, but once it really kicked in, I think on mindsets, well, you know, uh, some guys, you know, not everybody. A lot of guys ran away. A lot of guys took off. Uh, a lot of guys hid and just wish for the best. But there were a few crews that were out every day, you know, in the trenches. And obviously we were one of them. Uh, Billy Catola's crew was our main adversaries. Uh, there's another guy, Joe, I'm, you know, I think he's back out, so I'm not gonna mention his last name. Uh, but it's a guy that Greg wanted in the worst way. And to this day, I'm not 100% sure why. Uh, you know, uh, I actually liked him and I think he liked me, we were friendly. Uh, but it was, uh, but he had a, he was definitely somebody to consider during the war. Uh, but you know, they shot at us first and we were still holding back. Ultimately, after they got the first guy, Hank, I remember saying to Greg, I don't like us not doing anything. I says, we're just sitting around Carmine's, you know, worried about the other families. I said, but meanwhile, we're going to get clipped one at a time here. We got to at least let them know, keep them on their toes. And he agreed with me. He called Carmine in. Meanwhile, Carmine was above him. And he says, Carmine, it's open season. We're not waiting around anymore. And Carmine couldn't buck him because he didn't want to lose Greg. Without Greg, he would have had no shot at that war. So we went out and we started getting revenge. You know, we hit guys. The first guy we hit, he was, he was you know, it's sad to say, he was hanging his Christmas wreath. And uh, the newspapers put up a big uh, headline, Silent Night, Deadly Night. But that was one of Wild Bill's guys. You know, uh, a few weeks later, there were shootouts with this guy Joe and some others. Uh, then we eventually uh, got Nikki. Nicky Black, which was a very big, very big hit in the war. Uh, he was uh, elevated to council year by Vic Arena. So uh, that was that sent shockwaves through the arena faction. And then, you know, uh, we got Larry Lampese, who was a, a, a good fellow on their side. Not so active in the war, but he didn't back. He didn't come back very long. And that's what Joe T said. Joe T liked this guy a lot. Joe T was our boss. He's actually partners with him in the bus company. That shows you how treacherous this life is. Uh, so, you know, there wasn't, it was, you know, I remember Danny tried to hit me. I caught the move and, you know, I jumped out of the car. I had the vest on with a couple of guns, well, one gun only that day. But nobody wants to get shot, so they took off. Uh, but, you know, a lot of this is in my book. I'm not getting into every little detail. Uh, but and I've spoken about it so many times, but uh, it was really uh, like says a nightmare. It's, but once you were in it, uh, and it was kill or be killed, I don't regret how I acted during the war because you can't change what it was. 
I was in this wall, and I wasn't going to run from them. Uh, I wasn't going to let them take what was mine. And I had Greg, the Grim Reaper, as my boss, which was uh, also empowering. Okay? It's not because I was the t- toughest guy in the street. He probably was. But that's tarnished now. But still, he was fearless. <clears throat> you still could get shot. You still could get arrested by local cops. Uh, although I have a little concern about that now, too, because not the cops. Uh, I don't think he cared at the end if he got shot because he, you know, he had the AIDS and he was going to die anyway. So, I mean, I can get, you know, much more detail, but I think that's the gist of it. They were shooting back and forth. It was bloody. And as a matter of fact, we're working on with, you know, with Mob TV. Uh, that's the, the television station that I'm on the board of. And I had my, my show there, uh, my talk show. Uh, we're working on uh, Colombo Wars. And obviously, I've got the third one covered, but we're going to do all three of them because the Colombo family's been at war since the friggin' 50s. There, there was, you know, there was some peaceful times, but they were never, never, ever just really like harmony. Like when Carlo Gambino had the Gambino family, no problems. Uh, you know, I guess when Joe Bonanno had his family, they had several years, no problems. The chin all those guys, but uh, the Columbos were always on thin ice, always ready to erupt. So that should be good, and it'll be, you know, really uh, the, I think the uh, the climax will be the third and final war, because it's the war to end all wars. It, you know, that along with the other uh, new bosses, the young, these bosses that came in that weren't ever groomed or educated, or, uh, you know, prepped for that position someday, took over and took over in ways they weren't supposed to. Uh, and the whole thing crumbled. The thing crumbled. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, I don't think it'll ever be the same. So the first war was, um, um, according to what I, what I think would be, um, before the, Colom- the Colombos were actually a Colombo family, um, they were called the Profaci family, and it was the Profaci yes. that went to war, correct? Exactly. That would be it. And it's funny because, yeah. so yeah, so we were talking about the original war. What I, I know most of that from what I heard from Greg, because he, he told me a lot about the, the, the history of the family and especially the wars and how funny, not funny, ah, but funny that uh, peculiar, some guys wound up back together. Like that war we're talking, Fachi and Gallo, you know, the Persicos and, and Gallo and Greg and Scappy, these guys were all friends, younger guys, when that Joe Gallo decided to go against the uh Greg and Pro didn't. They were loyal to their boys like they're supposed to. They had to continue. Uh, and Epi, I, you know, I, I got to check with Greg Jr. on this because I thought we had a discussion Greg Jr. and I were he's not so certain about this, but Greg, I remember Greg Sr. telling me that Scappy at one point stayed with Gallo. And him and Scappy, who was our captain for a while, were trying to kill each other. And here they are, I see them together, and all them, dear friends, like they would give up the world for each other. So it's funny to hear that at one time they were pitted against each other. But fast forwarding to the third, I could sit now. Because, you know, like young Catola, the son, we're friendly again. But during the war, we were trying to kill each other. You know, the Campy brothers, I was I was fighting with them. We were, you know, chasing each other down in the streets. And he, fast forward, he spent a week with me in Florida at my house. You know, so we were friends once and we were friends. It's just the nature of that war, of that world. So anyway, uh, that was the first one, correct. The second one, I believe, and again, I'm not a historian. I go by what I heard from Greg, some things I learned, was when Joe Colombo got shot. And now Persico wanted it, but there were others, too, that thought they were eligible, like Vinny Alloy. Uh, so I think the guy that they put up there, uh, oh, what was his name? Yak, Joe Yak, Yacovelli. 
uh, took it for a while, but it was just on an acting base. A of I think there were, I need to learn more about that for the show, but there's people that I'll have on that were alive and could really talk about that better than me. Uh, I'll just sort of sprinkle in what Greg had told me. Uh, but then again, fast forward to the third war, nobody has a, more of a bird's eye view than me that's left alive today. You know, being with him on every single meeting, every single hit, uh, every, you know, there's nothing that happened. I was with him 24 7, and so was Jim. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so they was Bufacci first with Gallo, then a mixture of rumblings between people that wanted that spot when Joe Columbia hit. Uh, and I, Gallo was still around, of course, at this time. So some people say it was him. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of this right now. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what it was said. Greg told me he's, he thinks the government was behind the Colombo hit because uh, he was getting this Italian Civil Rights League too, too strong. And, you know, if you look at different things in history, things like that do happen, okay? And the, the minute it happened, he was shot by a black guy. And the black guy that did the shooting was immediately shot by one of Colombo's bodyguards, a guy named Chubby. Chubby was ushered out of there, and he didn't get arrested. He never was confronted for that. And as a matter of fact, he got straightened out a couple of days later for doing that heroic act. And you, it makes you wonder. I mean, you know, there were cops all around. Everybody saw this and, and nobody arrested him. So I would have never thought that. And I would, have, you know, but there's a lot of things Greg told me as time went on about the government and the presidency and stuff. I says, how does he know this stuff? But it proved true several times. Uh, so anyway, so Joe Gallo was still in that mix. Uh, and I think at that point, him and Persico were really going at it. As a matter of fact, Persico got shot. You know, he got ambushed, uh, and the legend is he spit the bullet out. But what happened was he put his hands up, and the bullet went through his So it, it wasn't lethal anymore when it entered his mouth. So hand, he still has a hook in his hand like that, but he spit the bullet out. And that was the legend, that he spit the bullet out. So, you know, uh, but Greg told me how it actually happened again. So, uh, But, yeah, that's a, that's a tough history to have, the family fight in all those years. I mean, that really starts making you think. I mean, like, you know, with the whole uh, Joe Colombo, you know, at the square with the, you know, like, like what Greg was telling you, because, I mean, that sounds so similar. I mean, I don't want to get into, like, theories or uh, any sort of mm -hmm. um, any sort of stuff like that. Um, but, I mean, you know, get the pieces of the puzzle and put them together. I mean, you know, JFK, Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby. I mean, it's all, yep. it's all, yeah. It, it, how did, how did Jack in, Ruby just walk into the courthouse with a gun, with law enforcement all around? I mean, it, that doesn't add up. Uh, there's a lot of things like that. Well, Martin Luther King, too. Martin Luther King, too. You know, look how the FBI used Greg to help them with the Ku Klux Klan. Who's to say they didn't ask the Ku Klux Klan to help with this serious movement that was getting too strong? You never know. I don't... I, I, listen, it, it, there's nothing that uh, I wouldn't consider what I would say is impossible because I, you know, every time you think you see it all, something else happens. So, yeah, I, I, I read up on a lot of that stuff and I question the, the, uh, the discrepancies and the misstatements and the stuff that they won't say. I, I question all that stuff and, and a lot of these different uh, conspiracies, if you want to call them. Yeah, I mean, a part of the one part of the Irishman, if, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I could be wrong on this, but um, part of the Irishman in, in that movie, um, which came from a book, um, they claim that, you know, when Frank, from the mouth of Frank Sheeran, he ran the guns down to Dallas by truck to, for all the stuff that portrayed in that called theory of that the JFK was a mob hit. Yeah, well... You know, I, I think 
from what I've learned, and I, I've, I've interviewed Scott Bernstein, who is probably the foremost uh, authority on Hoffa. He's been, he lives right there. He's the Jerry Capisi of the Midwest. <clears throat> and he, the things he said were supported by some facts. It just turns out to be the perfect murder because whoever was involved, nobody spoke. They never were able to find the body. Uh, and it's really that I don't think there's much of a conspiracy. I think most people know from what's out there is why and how and pretty much who the groups that did it. I do know from what Scott said, the Detroit family is a little upset that they, the, the way he's portrayed is that they had to go to another family in Jersey for help when they were a very good proficient crew themselves. You know, so I don't think there's any really hidden conspiracy there. I don't think the government was behind it. Uh, it's pretty much known it was a mob hit because he was not uh, obeying orders anymore. Um, so back back to, you know, life in prison as a wise guy. Mm -hmm. um, is it like, you know, being portrayed like in Hollywood, you know, where, you know, in Goodfellas, they show them cutting the garlic with the razor blade, bringing in the lobster well, tails. Yeah, no, you, you, okay, it, the, the whole prison si system on a federal level changed. It's not what maybe what it once was. Maybe there were prisons back in the 60s that were these so-called country clubs, but all the prisons I was in, and I was in a bunch, uh, were very uh, military, okay? You're up at the crack of dawn, you're working. It's like a, a mini work camp. The more years you're in, the better jobs you can get so, you know, you could live a little better. Uh, basically, everybody's equals. Uh, now, that being said, if you're a guy that was respected in the street, you'll get that same respect if you carry the title. But you can't abuse anybody or you'll get beaten yourself. And it's happened several times. I saw bosses get beat up because they still thought they were, you know, calling shots and telling people what to do. Uh, so as far as cooking, I was running the book in every, every place I went to. I was a bookmaker. Okay. I was supporting myself. Uh, and it's stamps. You pay with stamps and you collect with stamps. That's the currency. And I could live better because of that. What I would do is if there's a guy in the kitchen, I give him four books of stamps a week. It's 20 bucks. That's all it was at the time. Maybe tw Well, it was 20 bucks because they were $5.35 for a book of stamps back then. Uh, but we rounded it off to $5. So if you had extra books of stamps, you had extra cash. So I would give a guy four books of stamps. I'd get egg whites every day. I'd get broccoli. I'd get tuna fish. So I was eating well. Uh, and they would do that stuff, chopping the stuff up in the kitchen. But it's not like what you thought. It's very rare to get somebody to bring in booze. Not that it didn't happen, but it wasn't like like the, the movie show. Uh, it's, I guess, few and far between. Yeah, is the is the right way that that happens. Uh, you know, in the visiting room, a lot of times the sandwiches smuggled in, things like that. But it, it's it's definitely not a country club. They took the weights away. They took the HBO away. They took you know, the TV is just one big room. And the funny thing is they did that because uh, the politicians were trying to be so tough on crime. Look at them now, <laughs> what, what they're doing. They're allowing crime like it's, uh, it's, it's good. It's good for the country. Um, but they wanted to look like they were tough on crime. So they go out there and they say, we took all this away from the prisoners. They can't have weights anymore. And anybody that worked in the prison, like wardens and associate wardens, they fought that harder than we did. They did not want to lose that. They lost their leverage. If you can't lock us out of the gym, if you can't turn off the TVs, there's nothing to punish us. So what are we, you know, what are you going to do? We're in jail already, you know. So the, the people that really know didn't want that all to happen, but it did. They took everything away. They took away good time. Uh they took away the judge's right to 
uh, sentence a guy accordingly. Now they just have to set, set them to whatever the book says. So it's no, it, it's, it's, I, I would rather done state time because there you get good time. You get packages sent in, you have conjugal visits. Uh, don't believe the movies. And the other thing is you don't have to believe is all these rapes. There's so many, uh, which, how do I say this and not uh, alternative lifestyle guys in prison that they just congregate and they have their own little group. If you don't bother with them, if you don't welch on gambling debts, if you don't get involved in the drugs that are coming in and out and the buying and selling and throwing them over the fence and all this nonsense and bringing them in through their behinds, if you don't get involved in all that, you just do your time, keep your circle tight. Uh, that's what I did. Uh, I played sports every day. Uh, that's the only time I got in fights was on a basketball court because I was a fantastic basketball player. Uh, I was always picked first or second. Uh, and, you know, some of the black guys grew up with that, and they were 6'6 six, six and 6'5, six, and they still picked me. Uh, so I had that was about the only time. Uh, I, I exercised every day. I read every day. I wrote. I started writing my book uh, on my life story. So you can do the time uh, positive in a positive way. It's not easy, but you can. If you avoid those things, like I said, the bad things, work out, read, play sports, handball, softball, uh, you know, baskets. Uh, and that's what I did. I even taught classes. I taught, you're not allowed to teach martial arts, but I did it in a way where we were doing an aerobic type but everybody was punching and kicking and moving. And, and it was really a great class. I did it when I came home. I continued on in, in, in regular places. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot that is, is not really real. Uh, and you could avoid problems and uh, just carry yourself the right way. And like I said, you know, uh, some of the Italian guys didn't like me playing basketball. But I said, look, I got to do the time. Uh, you know, that's two hours I get out of the day. Then I play handball for two hours. I work out in the morning for two, two hours. There's six hours gone. Then I read and write and I go to bed. And I did that for almost nine years. About, yeah, I'm on my whole 10 year sentence. Whatever few months they gave me off, I don't even know. So. Did you ever come across anybody from the wars that were on the opposing side when you were going in oh, and yeah. out of any of these? I, I, I was with Vic Arena, which was a shock to me because they wouldn't let me with Jimmy, my partner. They kept us apart. I said, what do you think? We're going to take over the prison system? I mean, give me a break. You know, we were done. We were ready. We wanted to do our time together. We were hoping, but no, no way. They kept me apart from a whole bunch of guys. Uh, but yet, at one point, they put me with Vic Arena. Uh, there were others. I, I you know, uh, it's hard to really remember all of them now, but, you know, definitely guys on our side and some guys from the other side, too. But that one is one of, no, Vic Arena. Of all people, how did they put me with him? That's that's because the base point of the war, you know. He, he was yeah, like, I mean, here's a guy that you know. But you know, uh, yeah, Patty Amato was a captain on the other side. We were hunting him down in Long Island every day for months because uh, he was close to Vic Arena, and uh, he was one of the first guys I saw when I came in. And I remember him telling me, "This is a this is a funny story worth telling." Uh, First guy comes bopping over to me is uh, this uh, Mikey Spinelli. Uh, he's the one that got the first unceremonious button where he got made in prison. But, you know, I respected it. I, I, I got it. I knew what they did for him, and I know what he did for them. So, uh, but he comes over with sunglasses on. He's got a bag for me with Snickers bars and socks and extra underwear, getting me ready for my you – know, he's like uh, after spending two weeks in a county jail in Florida where I got pinched. Then he says, he starts, uh, another guy comes over, Mike, I'll leave it at that because he's out again and he's, from what I hear, he's active. Uh, but a guy I grew up with, he came over, very good to me. Uh, he was actually there when me and Vic had a confrontation, but that's another story. We'll do a part three. We'll talk more about that stuff in part three. So, uh, but he uh, tells me, he says, you know, Patty, he's here. he wants to come and say hello. He's a little concerned how you feel. 
I says, bring them over. I says, we're all in here. We got to fight the case. There's nothing left for us. So he comes over. I shook his hand. We, you know, said all our hellos, our hugs. And he says, boy, oh, boy, I'm glad you don't feel this like Greg does. And they told me the story. He says he was walking to the elevator. You know, you go in between these sally ports from one to the other. And he gets out of the sally port, getting ready to go on the elevator. The elevator door opens. Who's on there? Greg. Greg already had an eye shot out. It was still oozing. I mean, just kept bleeding, even though it wasn't dangerous anymore. He had a big socket. He didn't wear a patch or anything. And it was still, like, oozing blood. He saw Patty. He was cuffed up. And he ran after Patty like he wanted to bite him to death. And Patty's telling me the story. I was laughing. I said, you got to be kidding me. He says, no. He was trying to bite me. I don't know if he wanted to give me AIDS, if he wanted to bite my neck off. He says, but... I'm just so happy you don't feel that way. I just I shook my head. I didn't even know what to say. I mean, I knew the guy was ferocious, but uh, vicious, whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, so going back to that, we, we did pass people, uh, you know, from both sides back and forth to over, over the 10 years. So, um, like, prevention. Um, when you first got out, you know, you started your new life tried to um, come into a new positive way. It was the new version of Larry Mazza. Um, from an addictive standpoint, like myself, I call, you know, a lot of people call from the addiction world, it's like replaying the tape to yourself. What prevents you to go back to the old life? And for me, what I do as a memento to myself is every morning when I get up, I open my medicine cabinet, there's my razors, my toothbrush, um, all my toiletries that mm -hmm. I need to get started in my day. When you open up that medicine cabinet, hanging inside is from over three years ago when I was released from the hospital the last time that I had been under the influence of any sort of drugs mm -hmm. or alcohol, and I had a really close call. That was my final final day since as of today that you know I fed into my addiction. So every morning waking up with that arm bracelet from the hospital when I was released, I hung it in my medicine cabinet to give me that reminder every day to replay the thing, mm -hmm. which is something I learned in the AA, how to, you know, keep replaying the tape off so you remember so it stays fresh to you not to recommit right. or re-feed into your addiction. So when I see that medicine cabinet open up, I see that band every morning, that reminds me that if you walk out this door today, and you go back to that old life, you're going to go back to what that is, if not worse. And it kind of keeps the right. point and fresh. Is there anything that you can relate to that, that, you know, coming out? Well, new version of yes, yes. It's not quite as physical. It's more mental. Uh, I think we touched on this a little or, or I talked to somebody about it recently. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same negative thing over and over. Okay. And you have to learn from your mistakes and you, you and your bad choices and decisions. So I did. I had a lot of time to think about these things and where I went, made the mistakes and took that wrong turn in life. So I have a son that is very important to me. I have a wife. I have a family. I have a grandkid now. Uh, and those are all the things you need to reinforce that you don't want to go back into something like that because it always ends up bad. It never ends up good. There are a lot, you know, and why, now that I'm older and knowledgeable and understand, nobody could seduce me into that life because now I know I can earn a living. I can get respect. And that's what I would tell a kid today. You don't need a mob or a gang to earn money or to get respect. And I firmly believe that now. So with that and what, like I said, my family and, and everything I have going on, I, I would never go back to that. Never. I would never be controlled by anybody. And it's funny. I never feared anybody in my life. And not because, again, not because I was this, uh, you know, heavyweight killer gangster. It has nothing to do with that. I didn't before I was in the life. The only time I started fearing anybody was when I was in the life. Because now you have to fear your captain. 
or you're superior. You can't, you got to walk on ice sometimes or on thin ice because if you mess up, you're going to sink. So you, you start worrying. But my whole life, I, I knew how to conduct myself. So I never had to worry. I never had to fear anybody. Uh, so it's like, it's a peculiar thing. And, and I don't want that life of looking over your shoulder again because you're doing too well and somebody's jealous that they're going to want to come and take what you got. That's sort of what happened with the family. You know, they, they weren't happy with their positions or getting half of what Junior earned. Vicarino wanted it all, you know? So look what happened. Lives got destroyed. Uh, so just a memory of what I went through. It can't happen again. Uh, and I always say this too. I am not living the life of an angel. I don't, you know, I'm not a, uh, I'm sorry to say I don't go to church, you know, but I didn't, you know, I, I pray in quiet when I, when I want to talk, got stress. I, I pray. I'm, I don't need to go to church and I, I haven't, uh, you know, but there's guys out there, um, like, uh, Mike French he's found God, he's a minister. And, you know, I, I don't think it's a fake act. I think he's seriously is religious and he goes about trying to help kids through that. John A. Light, he's very much into helping kids not make the same mistakes. I've always said, I think it takes more credentials. I don't have them to go sit and be a, a, a psychologist and tell these kids, but I could tell them the facts. And one of them is you don't need that life or the gang to make money or get respect. You do it on your own. You know, and the other thing I, I, I would say is I, I've learned things from the interviews. Uh, a dear friend of mine, Stevie Lanahan, he said that he'll look in the camera and he say, any of you kids out there, okay, look at me. I hate what I did. I hate what I did. I had a rat on friends, and he used that word, that I loved. But if I had to do it again, I would. Because of his circumstances, whatever they were. He had a daughter, and she needed him, and different things. And nobody wants to hit excuses, but whatever it is, he did it. His point is... You will be in this seat someday. You will be facing life or turning on your friends or turning or making a deal with the government, however you want to put it. He says, There's, those are the only two ways out. And I added, or dead. A lot of us guys in the life will end up dead. So those are the messages. And they're not, again, I don't have to go on a crusade to say that. I mean it from my heart and... Uh, you know, I think it's maybe part of the reason I went through what I went through. If, if you are religious and you believe things happen for a reason, uh, and I wouldn't change anything because everything I lived through is why I'm where I am today. Why I have a son, why I have a family, why I have everything that I have. I, I lived through some bad stuff. And there's a reason for it. So, you look and forward, what, move ahead. There should be no, like, there's no regrets on my end. And, you know, like, if anything, you know, I can look back. And when I first got, found sobriety, you know, I looked at the life I passed, like, 10, 11 years. And all the time wasted, all the money wasted, everything that came yes. with it, the bad things I did and everything. Um, and I just, you know, I can't thank God enough for you know, the wisdom that was given to me, um, because I wouldn't be sharing here with you today. We wouldn't be sharing our wisdom to people that are on the fence or ready to give up yeah. hope or faith. Um, yeah. Let them know that it's not too late to start over. Um, you know, one of my, no. um, because of that life I live now, I really like think of things like, you know, somebody that's in a gang or somebody that's involved in, um, you know, um, trying to stay sober and stuff. They look at things, but they, I guarantee you, if you talk to them while they're, involved they never have the backup plan until everything's pulled away from you that's when you start seeing the big picture and looking and seeing that you know now what now what so because i once had everything that was taken away from me and now i'm slowly trying to walk my way back up the ladder everything that i encounter in life i always look at with the possible worst case scenario outcome i don't just 
take the take it and run with it. I always say, well, what happens if A, B, and C falls through? So now what's my backup plan? So I think that always keeps me like sharp and fresh and on point when it comes to any yeah. scenario or to avoid challenges that are thrown my way. I'm prepared for them now. Like if, if a challenge right. was to occur, I'm sharp enough to be able to already probably have it premeditated and I'm ready for it and I can right. knock it out of the wall faster than yeah. years past when I was, you know, weakened into, into addiction. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. And also uh, you, you've learned from it. So you know how to move forward. Uh, you, you're not going to make the same mistakes. And there's a lot of people like us that are making the best of a second chance or best of uh, a comeback. There's a lot. We're not the only two. You know, there's so many, and there's some that just can't get back on their horse. They just, they just suffer. They keep, they go back to crime, and they go back to drugs, and they go back to drinking. They can't. So we're the ones that maybe somebody will watch someday and say, if he could do it, I could do it. You know? All right, guys. Like, thank you for coming out to Sober Sit Down for our first episode. We just wrapped up with Larry Mazza. It was a very good show. Lots of good positive advice that Larry liked to share about his old stories. Um, current success stories and how he stays motivated to move forward. Um, if you like what you've seen, please click and subscribe below. We're going to have a lot more coming out shortly and um, a lot of different types of guests. We have from ex-mob affiliates to athletes to actors and um, just some local people in my own neighborhood who I like to bring in and share their story as well, coming from addiction to struggles to mental health issues, and this point of the podcast is to just make sure everybody stays positive, stays developing hope and faith. If you're going through a rough time, reach out to friends and family, watch inspiring content like we're ready to put out, and we just are here to help others to keep fighting the fight of everyday struggles. And if you like what you've seen, once again, please subscribe below and like and um, share with your friends. Thank you for coming out. We'll be seeing you soon.